It's going to heat up in here. <laughs> it does. It does get hot in here. It it's does crazy, get hot in here. Crazy it room. Does. Yeah. But it is going to heat up because we're back for another podcast. Welcome back to the Odium and Andrea show podcast for myself, and my beautiful wife, Andrea, get together and talk about a book that Andrea has read about someone who's done something really cool or about a topic that's pretty interesting um, that we kind of want to discuss and see if there's any ideas or philosophies that we can incorporate into into our lives mm-hmm. um, because we're trying to live the best life possible and maybe there's some stuff out here that, uh, that uh, you know, you might want to try for yourself. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why you listen to us. Um, <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So today mm-hmm. we're going to be reading, this should be interesting, the Comfort Crisis, mm-hmm. Embrace Discomfort to Reclaim Your Wild, Happy, Healthy Self by Michael Easter, Easter, Esther, Easter. Easter. So that's the book right there. So, I mean, there's a, like a billion things I can say about <laughs> this already in terms of um, being comfortable. Uh, we've dealt with this issue quite a few times and mm-hmm. obviously Goggins talks about it quite a bit. Um, a lot of people talk about, you know, just kind of pushing yourself beyond your limits or whatever. Um you know, get on to the other side, but um, mm-hmm. we'll see what this this guy has to say. Um, so yeah, so right before we get into it, um, of course, as always, if you like the stuff that we do, check us out, odoomandandrea.com. We got lots of other podcasts on there, and um, well, actually, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. Cool. So do you have anything else you want to say? Sure don't. Besides from telling us about uh, about the book, The Comfort Crisis, Michael Esther. Easter. Easter. That's what I said, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, take it away. So I picked this book because it's been pretty popular in like the personal development and like goal setting kind of stratosphere if you're into that kind of thing. Right. And so I've seen it around for a while. But well, are then, you into that kind of thing? Of course. <laughs> um, but sometimes like it takes me a while to like, I'm like, oh, what can this book possibly teach me? All I right. was like that with Atomic Habits and then I read it and I was like, oh my God, this book just changed my life, even though I thought right. I had some pretty good habits. So yeah. it was kind of the same thing for this one. I was kind of like putting it off reading it. But then one of my favorite podcasters, um, Dr. Peter Atia, mm-hmm. he was saying how much he loved this book. He's read it like three times. He gave it yep. to his daughter to read and I was like, okay, I guess I better read it. So it was awesome. And then plus the other thing is, is like the importance of struggle. And we've talked a lot before about the importance of struggle yep. and getting uncomfortable is so important. Right. And especially like even just on a daily basis, like, like Rogan says, like you do your workout and you do like a really hard workout, you know, literally anything else you tackle that day is not going to be as hard. And right. so it's good to have yeah. that struggle and uncomfortness. And for me too, uh, a little bit of struggle defines, I think it defines a little bit of who you are and gives you a little bit of meaning and purpose in life yeah. because if everything's just too comfortable, it's just, you wake up and that's why I can't do vacations. I, I can't do I vacations because you I just know. sit there I know. and do nothing, I know. you know, unless you have a shit ton of money or whatever, and you can go and you can go on like surfing adventures or adventures or, or whatever, then that's okay. But the, the whole idea of, Hey, we're going to go on a cruise and we're just going to sit down on a boat and we're going to sit by a pool all day. Like, I, well, I'm done. I'm done after the first day. Like yeah. I can't. I got to do something. There's got to be something to that I got to work on to feel like I'm just moving forward in some yes. way. Anyways, yes. yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, I think that's yeah. Struggle's important. Yeah. So his background, the author's background, is he's already a journalist. He wrote like a bunch of different articles for like Men's Health and I think a couple other magazines and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And he's 28 and he realizes he's not actually as healthy as these articles that he's reading. Right. And not only that, he's an alcoholic. Yeah. And so he realizes he needs to quit and he realizes like, how difficult it is to get sober and he says day by day i embrace the raw discomfort of hard change and soon the world opened up yeah so he gets sober and then for one how long does it take him do you know i'm not sure yeah i'm not sure he then goes on a hunting expedition in nevada for a um an article he's writing and he goes with this pretty with this pretty famous hunter and he's like this sucks <laughs> like mm. i'm bored i'm cold he didn't wear like the right type of clothing the food sucks like everything's uncomfortable yeah. but he gets back and it's like 
everything's so easy and it's like you appreciate yeah. it so much he's like 100 back in las vegas and that it's so hot but he they have air conditioning and yep. it's so easy to get like you know food and all of these things and he's like he looks around and he realizes that just like comfort is everywhere and he's like what but he felt really good when he came back from it like yeah. he just felt so good but then it wanes, I think, too, right? And you have to almost kind of keep exposing yourself to that discomfort to be able to recognize the comfort and the good things you have and to appreciate of them course. a whole lot more. And I think what mm -hmm. this reminded me of was when we did our backcountry camping yep. in Algonquin. And that was when we came back after that trip and had our our first meal, our breakfast at that restaurant. Yeah. Literally the best breakfast. You loved it. I was so good. I, was, I still like no one can do breakfast right, but uh, oh, but well, I know what you're saying. I, so I know what you're saying. Yeah. It's just like you sit down and someone's making you your own meal. Oh my meal, gosh! Whatever. I don't have to figure out how to do dishes and yeah. rehydrate shit. Well, just throw <laughs> the dishes in the lake. It's, it's pretty it's Anyways. easy. Anyways, <laughs> so he wondered what cleansing myself of all of these other comforts could do mm. for me, and so he was kind of getting must have like been getting obsessed with this idea of comfort and yeah. discomfort so i gave goggins a call <laughs> <laughs> shockingly no uh. um so he says kind of the thesis of the book is we're living progressively sheltered sterile temperature controlled overfed under challenge safety netted lives and it's limiting the degree to which we experience our life mm. which is so true and like we were just saying science even shows that when we are challenged we are we become physically harder mentally tougher spiritually sounder we're just overall better people right. when we're challenged and even things like it is protective if, against like chronic diseases like obesity mm -hmm. and cancer and diabetes like all of these things it protects against yeah. right and so but the biggest problem is is like our environment that we have created, like all these technological advancements, all this stuff, it has evolved faster than we have. And so our, our still like kind of Neanderthal or caveman brains are still wired that way. And so things like mm. social media and all these addictive devices are still well, like... That, we could talk a lot about that. I mean, yeah. that that's how these... I mean, these social devices uh, or social networks on these devices are designed in such a way to tap into our primordial instincts yes, of, exactly. you know, lighting up your hippocampus, not the hippocampus, the, um, what is it? Your pleasure thing. Yeah. The pleasure. Yeah. What, what's uh, it? I forget. Like I the forget. dopamine, right? Ever it's, mm -hmm. it signals dopamine and whatever yes. for those little hits, whatever. Anyways, but it knows what the body kind of wants and what it kind of craves in that short term gratification thing. And they're heightened to do that. So, yeah, I, I totally see what you're saying in terms of our evolution has not even come close to being able to match our technology. Yes. And it's only going to get worse because yes. technology doubles every, like the doubling of technology, like it shortens. What is the, uh, I don't what know. What the hell is that I stupid know, thing? I, I can't even remember. Oh, it's been so long about, yeah. I'm going to look it up. It's just that, is it Murphy's Law? No. Not Murphy's Law. <laughs> Murphy's Law is anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Oh, uh, it's that, the guy where technology doubles and yes. it just like, it's an exponential yes. growth basically is what it is. Exactly. Um, and so like, it's only going to get worse and there's nowhere where near that humanity can evolve to keep up with technology. Like, yeah. I mean, we can't even keep up with the laws that govern the technology with our evolution because our morality and our social structures change so slowly Yes, that there's all kinds of anyways. Well, and it, it causes these problems. Like, so we, like all of our physical comforts, like like being physically comfortable just sitting in a nice comfy chair sleeping in a nice comfy bed yeah. like all of these things have been taken care of being in climate controlled buildings yeah. but we there's, there's like there's trade-offs to it and i don't think we've like completely understand what those trade-offs are and how detrimental they are to our like mental health and physical health yeah well in it's, a way. It, it's it's one thing that i know sorry i don't know if you want to go on with the book here but like for example like for me my back pain and everything yes. that's all it's like Western lifestyle, a hundred percent that's caused that because all I'm doing is sitting down, I'm on a computer working yes. clickety clack, whatever. So all the things that I'm doing to try to combat that and try to like completely cure myself is doing things that people would normally do if they weren't living in a society that they're sitting in all the time. So I'm trying to squat all the time. I'm trying to move. I'm trying yeah. to get all those natural movements back into my life. And yeah, it's like, there's this trade off that we haven't even stopped to think of, yeah. is this really the way that we want to go? Is this, of beneficial to to humans and, yes. and how we live and we can just see now in our healthcare system i mean mm -hmm. 
everyone's sick, everyone's overweight and you know, I'm myself included, right? Like it's, you fall into that trap and yeah. it's, is it really, is, uh, I almost think, is the juice worth the squeeze? Like is the technology worth well, what we've given up in our health? And what he says, it, like we haven't moved the ball down the field in terms of the most impe- important metric, which is like our happiness mm-hmm. and our health span. Our, uh, yes, yeah. we have a longer lifespan, but you can argue health span is not the same isn't our happiness like almost the lowest it's been in a long time or it's really know. low compared to a whole lot of other people that we're gonna even talk, around the world we're gonna talk about that but yeah okay. absolutely the next thing that i do want to talk about though before we kind of get into it is he talks a lot about like comfort cr- creep and he did not make this mm. connection but as i was reading this i re- this really spoke to me and it's the one thing i wanted to pull out and talk to you okay. so there is this he references so many different studies and he talks to so many different scientists Mm -hmm. and psychologists and like all sorts of people. So he talked to this one Harvard psychologist and he wanted to find out if the human brain searches for problems, even when problems become infrequent or don't exist. So he had two kind of studies for this and I don't exactly remember what they were. One was people were given like papers or experiments and had to rate if they were ethical or not ethical. And so as time went on, they were given more ethical than non-ethical, but they were still marking like... The ethical ones as non-ethical. Yes. And so even though there was less non-ethical in the group, it didn't change the number of 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 studies they marked like the proportion of studies they marked unethical Mm -hmm. so even though there wasn't a problem there they were still looking for one okay so it was the same thing when they were looking at like faces that look i think i think it was faces i don't quote me on this but it was something like this where they were looking at faces that looked threatening and as they as time went on there was less and less threatening looking faces but there was still they were still reporting the same proportion of threatening faces even though there was less so like as the time went on like every Say they really looked at a thousand photos. The first hundred, maybe like 90% of them yes. would characterize as threatening. But then at that, the end of it, yes. like one out of a hundred, but they'd still say 50% but, yeah, is whatever. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yes. So that, you know, oh, sorry. And so, but what, what this spoke to me so much and he didn't make, like I said, he didn't make this connection, but I definitely did. So it's not what they found was like, we, maybe we experience fewer problems in our lives, but it doesn't improve our satisfaction level with things. And we don't, we're not more satisfied. And I think, I 100% think that this is where this whole wokeism and outrage culture is coming from is Mm. like, we live such easy lives. And so we're trying to look for a problem. You gotta there find something. really is no problem. Right. So the, I was just like, oh, uh, that explains a lot. Yeah, no, it, it does. And to go a little bit, well, to, to continue on that is, um, it's always like a baseline, yeah. right? So it's like you're saying as the study went on, they kept finding more and more things is because it's almost like it reestablishes your baseline where exactly. it's like, oh, well, there's 10 people. Exactly. So, well, I have to find the threatening ones or like, say you had a list of, rate them in terms of attractive or not attractive Mm -hmm. and like which ones and then you have a the people are constantly getting more and more attractive then all of a sudden you have to adjust exactly what your threshold Threshold for what you find attractive based on what you're what you're getting at absolutely Um, if you're not really conscious about it i think that's the thing too because if they don't know the study they're making sure that their yeah conscious bias or whatever can't really kind of pick up on it so that's very interesting but yeah absolutely like we live here at least in north america anyways the most prosperous, the most abundant of anything that we have. Like if you want to work and get whatever it is that you want and achieve what you want, you can like now more than ever start up a YouTube channel or whatever and start up a business. It It's the barrier of entry is nothing. Yeah. You can start anything. You can collect payments online. You could do everything that all the big guys can do. Maybe even better because you're more nimble and faster. It's all available. Internet's everywhere. Really? It's so ubiquitous there's almost nothing like for me thinking about when I was younger dealing with people that were racist or dealing with racism or whatever. Like I don't see any of that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well I do now, but it's on, it's the reverse way where like if you're not a minority, then you're so apparently the next incarnation of, of devil, right? Like it's, you're the yeah. most horrible person in the world and it's insane. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, people are trying to find, these problems because like you look at the civil rights movement or whatever i'm like martin luther king came out and said it 
uh, way back in, in the, in the, was it 60s, 70s? Whatever it was, that's, I should have known, it should have been the 60s. And, you know, and whatever was, uh, whatever, what was that freaking bill that was passed in the States? Uh, the Civil Rights Act or whatever. Anyways, I can't, can't remember, maybe it's just called the Civil Rights Act. Anyways, you know, abolishing all the different segregations and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And it's, it's like, okay, well, the battle is pretty much, they're still going to be the racist individual, whatever, but people. like the battle was pretty much won. You know, and it's like there's, you know, I can go anywhere I want. I can do anything I want. No one's bothering me because of the color of my skin, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then now, yeah, it's like this just this constant outrage of trying to find something that's that's just not there. But I guess if your life is so comfortable and you don't have anything that you can really attach to that has meaning, that gives you purpose and drive, then if you just kind of invent something, you're going to latch onto it. And people latch onto it because, yes, this is my purpose. You know, now then what's, you know, I got to fight climate you know i'm the uh, i have to i have to save the world this is the most like calm Calm down down. you know get your own shit together first before you can even think about saving the world these are complex issues you know they're not solved by just like that's it everyone just drive electric cars and the world's going to be a better place it's like well no no that's not how the world works anyways this is getting maybe a little bit bit. above and beyond here but being comfortable, I think, is a really big problem. I think it has led to this overcompensation of trying to fight these crazy injustices that like don't even exist. Well, because the thing is, in countries that are developing countries where they're just really looking to survive, they don't have the same type of problems we have in the Western no, world. Like no. they don't have these first world problems. Not at all. They just need clean drinking water. Like the, that's their struggle. And the other thing too is, is if you if you really want to help the world as an example this is totally getting off topic but if you want to help the world in terms of uh climate change or whatever like we need to get people out of poverty because once you're out of poverty and you have you don't have to worry about where's my clean water going to come from where's my food going to come from where's my electricity yes or how i can heat my home whatever have energy to do what i need to do then you could start worrying about these things that can better like your environment or your community and all that kind of things absolutely but anyways but Nobody well, wants to think well, about the solutions that way. But right? it's that Maslow's hierarchy of need that we talked about with Ross Edgley, mm. right? That those basic needs need to be filled first. Yep. And for many pe- people, they're like they're not. I'm te- we're, the kids and I are going through this right now in yep. our social studies. Yep. The next thing he talks about is the misogi. So the misogi is it's a Japanese legend. I won't get into the legend. Read it in the book. It's interesting. Or sorry, it's a myth. And so the point of this is he <laughs> found legend myth. Yeah, so, well, legend myth anyway. He <laughs> he found this guy that does this he, he, misogi. He does a misogi once a year. And so the first rule of misogi is you don't talk about misogi. No. So <laughs> <laughs> Fight Club. Actually, keep, actually, I, it, it is a rule. You don't oh, tell. You don't. You, you don't, don't advertise it. it. You don't advertise it on Instagram. You just kind of tell your close friends and your family. Yeah. It's no. 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 Like, hey, look at me. Look at me doing all this yeah, virtuous yeah. thing. No, no, as no, in, you're you, tweeting you it to make yourself no, yeah, look no, good. No, no, no. You do it for yourself. <laughs> right. Um. And so what it is is you do a challenge, and the challenge has to have a fifty percent chance that you're going to fail, and the stakes are high. And the other rule. The stakes are high. Like, what if you don't meet the challenge? You could something. You could something bad. You could die. Well, I don't want to. So the second <laughs> rule of this is don't die. Wow. So for, yeah. as one example, what they did, him and not the writer, but the guy he was talking to about doing this Misogi thing, him and his buddies, they got some like giant like rock thing and they put it at the bottom of some sort of harbor, like, and they would go down and pick this thing up and walk it like. Uh, like 10 paces then come back up and then the next person would go down the whole thing was they were going to move this big boulder across across this whatever. harbor or bay or whatever so it was like a weird kind of thing to do but it was really difficult and so the whole point is is you come back you do something that's really hard that you don't think you're going to be able to do right. but you dig deep and you find what you're capable of yeah and the thing is is in our societies we've lost this type of rite of passage to show right. that you can go out and do hard things and come back and become like a productive member of society. So, so many like across cultures, they have these rites of passage, these quests, these vision quests, whatever. And we don't have that anymore. We're not testing ourselves like that everymore. Hmm. I don't anymore. know if we ever had it. 
well maybe not (laughs) this culture but like many different cultures have had these rites of passage this hero's journey right Mm. where you have this call to adventure and it's really hard and then you come back and you feel it's like the the movie um i mean this is a movie but the movie 300 where at the beginning the guy he's the king and to go out he just out to the whatever to the to the wild and you know if you come back and survive after seven days then exactly. you're king or whatever or if you don't then i guess you, you died and you weren't fit to rule or what have you mm-hmm. and there's another remember the movie captain fantastic and this yes. is it's interesting so do you think that we should have something where like you know men have to do some or boys have to do something and then then you're declared like a man versus or like a same thing a woman you have to do a certain thing then then you're a woman because you know, there's certain tribes in the Amazon where they have to put their hands in the bullet yeah, kind exactly. of thing. Yeah. Or in, in the movie Captain Fantastic, it's like they go hunting they and then they, he has to kill a deer. Yeah. Or maybe that's his first kill all alone. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah. whatever, right? Or like, you know, you have to go on a hunt and, and do something. And I remember re- reading uh, Roots and mm-hmm. I can't remember what it is that they have to do, but they have to do something or whatever to prove oh, that they were, they so were many, they There's were so a man, many different right? ones. And the thing is, is like it's, it's cross-cultural. And so what's incredible about it is it's like it's arisen independently in so many cultures. So you yeah. know it's very important. And so, yeah, I think there probably should be. I think for women it's a little bit different because we naturally go through the rite of passage by going through um having our first periods let me tell you how bad that is right like that's kind of your initiation into womanhood right i guess we have still have you know puberty as well too sure but like (laughs) i would argue it's it's not the same plus we have like yeah and yeah sure i don't get into the minutia we won't get into it but the point is is like we don't have that now when you see like these increased levels of depression and anxiety in kids because they don't know what they're capable of Mm. And they don't know everything seems hard and there's like no resilience because they haven't been tested and they don't know what they're capable of. And a lot of, I mean, this is also really relevant to, to men nowadays because so many men have no purpose and whatever. And like, why is a guy like Jordan Peterson so popular? Mm-hmm. Because he generally tries to reach out to, I mean, he talks to anybody and yeah. does reach women, but his, his message really resonates with young men because they see society that they feel like they have no place in it of and course. no purpose in it. of course and he does he, his whole thing is to give that purpose back to back to men right yeah. um, and especially young men and that's as a, it's a great thing it's too bad he gets some of the hate that he gets it just gets people they don't want to hear this. they don't listen they don't listen because so you, it's it's just like david goggins they don't want to look in that accountability mirror they don't want to be told they're fat they don't want to be told they're lazy they don't want to hear the truth oh i That's just mean hard. no i just even mean people that just don't like him or think that he's some kind of crazy well because whatever I, I, right I'm, I think, I'm just saying i think people that say that just don't they haven't read his book they well, haven't that's actually I mean. listened that, that's what i mean right exactly him. like yeah. his whole his whole idea i mean he's a psychologist his yeah. whole thing is to help people yeah, exactly. get through hard times tough times right yeah. like that's his kind yeah. of mission in life right so yeah um anyways but yeah it all stems from this whole thing of just yeah comfort and comfort and meaning it's almost like yeah. it's almost like this, not it's not the same thing obviously but by by having some kind of task ahead of you that is difficult mm-hmm. it almost helps you define your meaning and, and and your purpose like i'm just thinking for for me right now like i took that we took this thing risk of quitting my job and whatever and it's not comfortable because there's I yeah. it's like I was talking to some people some people would not most people would not do what we do without having like oh I need to have at least uh, five oh, years of, of, of extra money of I'm like course. yeah six to nine months and that's it <laughs> get the shit together other you know like otherwise yeah. you know we'll the back to work or you. whatever right so it's you. like you gotta that discomfort is like such a drive to like okay well every day i gotta do something you know i have to push the rock forward a little bit or or else i'm you know or else i'm gonna drown kind of thing right so yeah and i think even just like doing a hard workout every day and that's why like i like to get my workout in the morning because i know nothing else like i'm gonna do well hopefully nothing else i'm gonna do (laughs) do in a day is gonna be harder than that workout i've pushed myself i know i push myself hard and then the rest of the day feels easy to me but even then even if you're just starting as well too it's oh it's not like you have to go and kill yourself like if we're going to give advice to somebody uh especially if you're like oh you know i weigh 350 pounds and what the hell i can't just go and run 20 miles like do what's good for you just wake up and show up yeah you know even for you maybe just walking you know one kilometer or half a kilometer 10 minutes is five good minutes. Is, is good for you and that's yeah. like a huge thing and you're sweating or whatever that's then awesome. that's great that's awesome then get 
get at whatever it is for you. Don't listen to anybody in terms of you have to do this or do that. No, you know what's good what's for you, you know what's on the heart. inside. Yeah. yeah. And um, and go from there. Challenge yourself and what makes sense and for the, you. And the thing is, is like it even improves like your like the myelination of your neurons in your brain. The myelination? Myelination. You're using so, too many big words. I don't understand. So myelination is the connections and like the... I think it's the insulation over your neurons. And so it helps the connectivity of your brain. So it improves brain power. And so it just improves brain performance across the board and it protects you against Alzheimer's and dementia and all those things. So being able to know that you're doing hard things, like it even helps with that, right? So it's really important. I wish there was, uh, it's too bad. Didn't we, this is totally off topic, but we were talking a few, quite a few podcasts ago about, the whole was it all Alzheimer's or Parkinson research being all Alzheimer's, kind of garbage Alzheimer's, for the yeah. yeah it's too bad because there was just a couple of days ago where Michael J Fox and Christopher Lloyd was in like some kind of comic con for a Back to the Future oh, okay. reunion yeah. and it's I mean those guys are just amazing and of course Michael J Fox I is know, just Parkinson it's just like I know it's so sad can we find a cure can here we get on this it's just yeah it's so sad to see but anyways yeah but these brain diseases are just something that's so terrifying and um. But yeah, it's like, does things like this is the idea that if you keep busy and keep active, is it proven that it will help your brain stave off from at least Alzheimer's anyways? Yes. Obviously Parkinson's, I think that's genetic. Or I don't know enough about Parkinson's to be honest, but but yeah, hundred percent the research so shows it helps. It's protective. Even though Alzheimer's. whatever the hell that research was false, yep, that yep, was yep, just because yep, I was yep. more about drugs yeah, yeah. per se. Right. So basically, well, it's more about etiology, like how it happens right so. so but just using your brain yeah. so if you don't use it you lose, you lose it, it. yeah gotcha uh so his misogi in the book is this guy yeah, yeah he goes to and he weaves this story throughout the book but his misogi i'll just tell you about you i'll just tell you about it right now he goes with the same hunter that he went with in nevada he goes with him way up into the arctic in alaska for a caribou hunt and so he's there for 33 days. They have to take, like, I don't know how many planes <laughs> to fly into Alaska for this caribou hunt. And oh, because so they fly into Alaska, then they're going all the way up to Yeah, so wherever. as he's on this trip, he weaves the story of this trip throughout his book and all mm-hmm. of the discomforts that he faces on this trip and why it's important. Like I always said, where are you going to poop? Where are you pooping up there? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. The next thing he talks about, I won't get, we won't get too into it because there's other things that are a bit more important, but I did want to hit on this one was he talks about rural areas versus urban areas Mm -hmm. and how people who live in cities are 21% more likely to suffer from anxiety and 39% more likely to suffer from depression than people who live in rural areas. So the point is being out in nature is really important. One thing that was Mm -hmm. really interesting is back in the eighties, um, Japan created these this nature based wellness program called forest bathing. That's where this comes forest from. Forest bathing? Yeah, bathing. Bathing. Okay, bathing. Okay. So you go out, you walk around. They found that after only fifteen minutes of being in nature, walking around in a forest or a park, whatever, didn't matter, your blood pressure and heart rate and stress hormones all decreased after only fifteen minutes. Yeah. Like it's un freaking real to me. Yeah. Well, how do you feel when you go out there and it's like, Oh, it's a nice day, you hear the waves of the water or whatever it is, you know? Hear the birds? It, it's incredible. And so he also talks about the difference between being lonely and being... Bored? No. Well, boredom's next. But being lonely and just being in solitude. And I forget, mm. we did talk about this in another one, but there's so many negative effects of being lonely. lonely. Yeah. And there's a whole, there's whole books actually written about it and so many studies showing how bad it is to be like to Because lonely is not lonely. having actual physical connection or any emotional connection yes. with other humans. Yes. Yeah. And so, and so and I it, think and we've it, talked about this before. It even decreases your immune system. Yeah. It depresses it. And so it's what why we talked does about this the say whole, about the lockdowns? That's what I was just going to say. Like lockdowns, what's... Yeah. The, the, one of the best things that you can have in terms of your immune system and your whole overall health is to be social and to be with other people. Yeah. And then so I was like, what do you do? What do we do? Let's just lock everyone down. You can't see anybody. It's like, yeah. okay. You're just making people more susceptible to the thing you're supposed to protect them from, right? So exactly. I don't know why any of that stuff's in quotations there, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah. But And so we're social animals. We need to have interactions Ooh, with our fellow humans. One of the, but main, in, one of the main 
um, punishments we give to prisoners is solitary confinement. It's the worst oh, punishment we are, you can give I'm someone not, is solitary I'm confinement. I'm not going to even get into the whole well, prison of course, system. Of course, but I'm just that, saying that that's the... That's the punishment, right? right? Oh, yeah. The worst thing sure. you can do to someone. But like the cities too, the way that are structured, it's like everyone's so busy. Like go walk around downtown somewhere and you're just like, yeah, some people might say hello, but it's generally nobody talking to each other. Their heads are down on the phones, whatever it is. And there's no sense of community at all. You don't know anybody. And, but you know, if you're in a rural place or a small place, you're just walking around. So people seem, they're much more friendly, much more ready to interact oh, with you. Yeah. And it's just, it's just such a different thing when it's you're living in the city. Even us, vibe. we're living in this apartment building. I know. And maybe this is on us too, but we like don't even know anybody. Yeah. Because you're everyone's just doing their own, just well, you're living in your yeah. own. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, it's yeah, like yeah. I said, maybe that's a little bit different, right? Yeah. But but for the most part, you know, you have a lot of people, but at the same time, there's everyone's no connection. Alone. There's no connection. Yeah. The next thing you talk or about, or the connections are superficial. Yeah. Like look at Tinder now. I don't want to know what it'd be like to date now. Just swiping this and that, no, and it's just no thanks. everything is just so superficial. We're just never getting divorced, so you're aware. Well, never say never. <laughs> is the way the way it is. <laughs> the next thing he talks about is bore- oh. is boredom, and so he says boredom was pronounced dead, and he gives the date that the first iPhone came out. I don't know what mm-hmm. date it was, and so. Um, I think this is really important and I talk, I think about boredom actually quite a bit and the kids are often bored. We're really strict with screens with them. I let them be bored if they're bored all the time. I, if they yeah, come they just go on, they figure it out. And though, they figure right? it out. And that's the point of being bored. He talks to, um, he talks to actually a scientist at university of Waterloo, mm, which, which is our former, um, his name is James Denkert mm-hmm. and what's the apartment? Mm. Well, I guess I'll find out when you tell me what it is. It's study. in brain, like brain something. Also, oh, kines- kinesiology, maybe. I think it. Uh, yeah, I think it was in kine- in kinesiology. And so basically, he's talking about how important it is this boredom is for our brain, this like unfocused portion of our brain, and like how important it is. And so when we're on our phones like all the time, we're overworking our brains, we're overstimulating our brains, and it makes us like makes people picky and impatient and distracted. And I think this is the one thing that I have observed and seen about people. If you're waiting in line for something or you have to wait like at the grocery store or something, Uh, people get pissed. No, but people get pissed off so fast if they have to wait at all for anything. And it's just like, Mm. this is what like we're in this. So like, we're talking about establishing that new baseline, right? Where we're not, we don't wait anymore. You get to Amazon. It's got to be delivered right away yeah and you know all that stuff and they've talked about not only is it important just to like let our our brains wander and just kind of like just explore just explore because like (laughs) like, even it's like the best ideas i have are when i'm in the shower just like everyone talks about that the the shower the the shower shower. ideas yeah they're the best ones is because you're just letting your brain be be free and then that moves on to this is an emergency what Okay. Okay. <laughs> and crisis averted. Crisis averted. We're back. Um, Everyone's fine. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how much of that we're gonna put on the. We'll have to do some minor editing to to get that out. Um, yeah. So, anyways, where were we? So I was talking about boredom and how important it is. Right. Right. And so the big thing about boredom. I can't think about it now. I'm gonna turn the heart, heartbeat <laughs> down, down a few notches. Down the, uh, watch after, the ticker. after that. Yeah. Yeah. So but boredom lets us tap into our creativity. So we were talking about how we get all of our good ideas in the shower because oh, our right. brain is just allowed to right. wander. I remember now. I was going to make some rude cro- shower comments. Probably. But, uh, so, it's like I don't do any thinking in the shower. Anyways. <laughs> we all know what you do in the shower. Anyway. <laughs> hey now. Hey now. We're, still, we're alive, by the way. Anyway. But he talks about this study that was actually done in, in 1958 and he was looking at kids that were like the ones that were kind of like the bad kids and sorry um, what year is this 1988 58 sorry okay. yeah so the kids with so sorry it was the kids with like ton of energy so they had ton of energy they had all of these big ideas and what's a better predictor of students like outcome and accomplishments mm-hmm. is not their iq scores but it's their creativity yeah so it's so important to have that boredom so yeah Anything. Well, you're saying it's important to have the boredom because boredom sparks creativity yeah, of course or it does. sparks some type of creativity or creative or original thought in order to get yourself out of that boredom yes. to keep your mind occupied on something that will actually 
yeah you can have something you can yeah. hang on to or whatever he right? even talks about like how it was it's like evolutionarily um important as well so imagine like you are a hunter gatherer and everything's problem solving absolutely sorry i totally interrupted you're a hunter gatherer and you're gathering these berries on a bush and you've kind of there's there's two different hunter gatherers the first one there's two the first one (laughs) the first one is picking the berries he picks like all like the ones that are like easy to get and then he just kind of gets bored and so he stops and then he goes to another bush and gets all the big ones. And so you, you're, you're pretty fast to fill your basket because you're going and you're getting all the easy to pick fruit, right? But then, you have, guess, yeah. but then you have this other guy who doesn't get bored. And so he's spending all this time, he's picked all the easy ones and he's spending all this time like looking and trying to find. So it takes him longer to pick as much as the first guy because he's, he's not going bush to bush to bush, getting all the easy ones. He's okay. trying to find for the hard looking ones. He doesn't get bored. Right. Uh, as the first guy would so it's in and there was other examples but that's not as, as good well. though because the guy who was bored and moved on faster finished his task faster exactly so the guy who was bored you mean yeah the guy that did get bored yeah so being bored forces you oh so, it's, right? so you're saying it's a good thing yeah. oh okay, yeah, okay. Oh, like course. how does this yeah. prove your point because it's yeah. the opposite because the guy is still lagging around yeah but so guy who's not bored so you're saying that guy who's not bored is taking their time they're not as creative well, I'm no, I'm saying about how it's evolutionarily how boredom has helped us. Can maybe help you. Has yeah. helped us as a species. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All so, right. Cool, cool. Yeah. And even like with the kids, right? It forces them to be creative. You know, you see yeah. they don't have screens. We don't have super interactive toys. We have toys where you have to use your imagination well, to like play Legos with. Legos is kind of the only like thing we Legos, have. Legos, like stuffies, right? And they have, so we're forcing them to use their creativity. Otherwise, they're just going to be bored all day. So you have to be creative and make right. up things and do your stuff. So it's yeah. really important. Yep. The next thing he talks about is one of my favorites and it's nutrition. Mm-hmm. And he talks about, um, well, the one thing he talks about was like a lot of his conversations when they were out hunting <laughs> revolved around food. And it was yeah, like, cause oh. they're probably so hungry. Yeah. Imagine. <laughs> were they only <laughs> eating what they would catch? Uh, yeah. And they brought a bunch and they, it took them a long time to get, um, like a caribou. <laughs> yeah. It took well, them they a think about hunting. I was like, that's got to be hard. Like, especially if you just have like bow and arrow. Or were they, what were they doing? Were they, did they have guns though? They or? were using guns on this one. Yeah. They were using guns. But even still yeah. to like sneak up on something to get close enough to even shoot it. Yeah. Like imagine like, you know, we when we were out camping, we're always worried about bears or whatever. Yeah. But it's like, good luck trying to find one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you actually want to, like if you're hunting one, you know, like, because they can smell you and hear you from so far away and then you just, you're like, nope, <laughs> no, no humans oh, yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, but it just reminded me of our trip because all of our conversations when we were portaging oh, they're all revolved food. around food. Well, that's because everyone was so, <laughs> we were so Well, you guys were. I was. I was. Well, I was me so and Maya talked all about cheeseburgers <laughs> for one like <laughs> yeah. whole like <laughs> Talking about four cheeseburgers. We're going to have to have one right now after I this. I know. So the one thing he talked. little talk- comfort food. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did, see what there. I did there. see what you did there. So he talks to, so he talks about like how 70% of the U.S. population, this is a staggering, staggering stat, 70% of the U.S. population is overweight or obese. Like it's that's 70%, 70% now? Like no. that is, Isn't yeah. Is yeah, that yeah. high? It's that high. Because I remember, wasn't it like 50% or know. 40% I in, uh, what's the, it's what's the unreal. movie? The Super Size Me? Yeah. Well, that was how many years ago now? Uh, I was like 20 years old. That's, is it that old? Uh, I don't know. I guess we're old too. We are old. Yeah. Um, 70%. Well, like no wonder, I guess, oh. on the top of fitness magazines are people that are not fit, <laughs> you know, like, or like the swimsuit edition where it's like. You're going to trigger me, man. Yeah. It's not, uh, <laughs> it's not what I like to uh, look at in a swimsuit edition, if he you know what I mean. But hey, whatever. He hey, hey, everyone's got their own whatever things, but. Again, I have a big problems when things are flaunted off as healthy when they're not healthy. Like, come mm-hmm. on, let's just not get ourselves here, pe- people. You know, mm-hmm. let's be real. He talks about his problems with nutritionists, and I identified with this so hard because I think so many nutritionists, it's just bullshit, and they're just pushing, pushing yep. stuff. And so his three main problems, which I one million percent agree with for the most part, I'm sure there's good nutritionists out there. However. <laughs> but- I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> he says the nutritionists don't deeply grasp the biological underpinnings and are too busy pushing a fad diet. Mm. 100%. Number two, because they're, especially the Instagram ones, they're always trying to sell you some sort of supplement. Of course they are. Number some supplement or like a band. Yeah. 
I just do with this band and do with some squats when you're with a band. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah. the second thing <laughs> is he says, and we should talk about David, Fung, uh, Dr. Jason Fung, because he talks about this as well. We need to the, have a podcast specifically probably dedicated. Oh, I think we we did way back in the day, I think. Yeah, back in the day, but yeah. we should do another one. Yeah. He says they, they say that people that don't follow their restrictive and complicated meal plans are lazy. Not the case. Mm. I don't think so. Doc, Dr. Fung talks about this as well. These people try so hard, but they're just set up for failure because these diets are such bullshit. Yep. So then the third thing he says is, yeah, and then they receive funding from the industry. From oh, of course whatever they are. It is. Of course yeah. they are. Wasn't he, I think, I think Dr. Fung pointed this out, was that the real decline, I think he's, he's Canadian, I think the, the Canadian. decline in the Canadian diet mm-hmm. happened the same year that the Canada released that food guide that you remember us, the yes. us old people at school with the <laughs> rainbow. rainbow where it's all the greens at the bottom and then it's the, well, then you have their vegetables, then it's the meat. Yeah. And then what was the last one? There's another, there's a four of them. Grains. Yeah. Grains is the one we have to have 12 servings. Yeah. Grains, or the vegetables. Meat and alternatives, yeah. dairy, vegetables. I said vegetables. Vegetables, grains. Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables, grains. Dairy. Dairy. Oh, dairy and meat. Meat Okay, so dairy was different than the meat one? Okay, yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, you have all these, and it's like three meals a day or whatever, and then like everyone's just getting fat because they're eating processed junk or whatever. Exactly. Especially with the grains. Especially with dairy. (laughs) Nobody needs dairy. Yeah. Except for cheese. You don't need it. Of course you don't need it. (laughs) He talks to a PhD, and this PhD guy's um, story, his name's Trevor Cashy. His story is actually really interesting, so I like read the book. But um, he has a really interesting approach to, well, he has just a common sense approach to nutrition. And he's Mm -hmm. worked with like any elite athlete from anything, SEALs, sports teams. He helped the Olympic tw- the Olympic team in 2016 win 16 medals with his nutrition approaches. And it's so simple. It's like obvious. But his whole point is he says like, I believe people should be doing less and eliminating limiters to their product, their progress. So it's not about like, don't eat this and trying to implement all these new things. It's like, well, He's like, well, why are you eating what you're eating? Like, let's Mm. look at that question first. And then let's, then his main thing is, is he makes people weigh and like track their food because that's the biggest thing is people completely underestimate what they're eating, how much they're eating. Or how much they're eating. If you take a thing, a spoonful of peanut butter, I guarantee you that spoonful is like at least two tablespoons, not one tablespoon that you're tracking in your MyFitnessPal every single time. And I'm guilty of it too, because peanut butter is so freaking good. Yeah. You know, you're having what's that tablespoon you put in there is you're grabbing yeah. way more. Peanut butter is not such a bad example because it's not that bad for you. At least the ones, well, if you make your own peanut butter, that's perfect. But yeah. It's got a lot of sugar in it too, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, so yeah, he, so he says, I would much rather address the question, why are you eating versus eat this food at this time? Right. Because it's a deeper, it's a deeper question of why are you eating what you're eating at that time? So it's like, not only why, why are you eating, but like when almost like, or, or, or is it like, because I know for me, like I have a problem when ever I feel like I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing or whatever, I feel like I, I can go for food. For his comfort. A lot of people use food for comfort. Yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. So is that the kind of question he wants to yes. tackle? It's like, yes. okay, it's well, why are you, why are you eating this type of ice cream right now? Yeah. But I mean, even if you know the answer, mm-hmm. it's still difficult to stop. It's like difficult. the guy was saying addiction at the beginning. It's like, mm-hmm. I asked you kind of how long he was been drinking for, like how hard was it for him to, to stop? It sounds like it was hard right and yes. same thing with well, of course a food is an addiction just like a of like course. alcohol right but i think once you come a, once you become aware of it it's that bringing that right. awareness to it i think is really at least really, it's out in the open it's out in the open yeah. and it's important and he says that the people that he was training it's like the people that are at a consistently healthy weight they don't have better genetics or a faster metabolism. They just have better coping mechanisms, mm, right. right? They're able to, instead of going to stress eat, they'll go for a walk. Right. And so or hit the punching bag exactly, or go for a run. Or exactly. And so when it's all about changing your behaviors mm-hmm. and. Which is why a lot of the stuff comes together with habits. What you're talking exactly. about, like learning, learning what your behaviors are, your bad ones and learning the tools you need to actually be able to instill better habits. Yeah. Yeah. And the one thing I loved, this is just a little bit of an aside, but he says he, he's 
he doesn't really like this whole people using like, oh, I just have fat genes. This is just my genetic people makeup. People say that? Oh, yeah, of course they do. Really? Of course they do. Huh. Um, and he's just like, I don't like this as an excuse. And whether you think it's a genetic thing or not, it doesn't matter. We're going to do the same thing with you regardless. It doesn't change kind of like, quote unquote, the treatment plan for someone no. that's overweight, right? You're still going to have to figure out what you want to eat. Yeah. And the other thing is he, he gives people kind of like, well, this is like your... It's like the, if it fits in your macros, right? He gives you, this is how many calories, you know, this is your bank account, this is what you get to eat in a day. And so, yeah, you, sure, you can choose to have like a chocolate bar. You can choose to have like a big bowl of strawberries. Which one is going to keep you full longer and which is going to keep mm-hmm. you more satisfied? You know what but I there's mean? There's also the thing too of maybe this getting too much in the weeds, but like, 200 calories of chocolate bar is not the same as 200 calories of strawberries. Well, no, of course not. That's the point, right? Right. That's the point when you're trying to fit it in your bank account. You have to eat a whole lot more strawberries, which is going to keep you feeling full longer. Right. Oh, that's the point. But I just mean in terms of of health, right? Like what is it they say? A calorie is a calorie, but actually kind of not really because you have to, there's so many other factors, right? Like. Yeah, you can't just look at it in, in a silo like that. Right. So right. he does talk about fasting as well. And just people just being comfortable with being hungry, being comfortable yeah. with that discomfort. And like, you're not going to die. Well, the hunger, the hunger comes and goes. And right. I don't think people like he talks like the people he was helping, like they didn't even realize, oh, I'm not going to die if I'm hungry. And it's like, oh, my God, you <laughs> cannot eat for days and days and days and be just fine. Yeah. Well, you got to be careful. Some people can get into comas or whatever, but. Yeah, if yeah. But f- your blood sugar or whatever, but yeah, yes. Yeah, of course, Gener- of course. That's the purpose of fat. But I'm just saying you miss a meal and you feel hungry. You miss two meals. Like you're oh, yeah, going yeah. No, no, to be fine. Like that hunger discomfort is like yeah. you're okay and it's actually, it's like it's good for you. So yeah. yeah. But we're designed that way. Exactly. Yeah. The next thing he talks about, because they do eventually kill a caribou and he's the one to take the shot. He really like debated with himself whether he was going to take the shot and actually kill because he was like he's like like i'm a journalist i didn't know as a journalist you're supposed to be the observer right and not like the participant in it i thought he went hunting before i guess he didn't kill he wasn't killing no no no, on the first one in the second one when he went to alaska and so he did and it was really like kind of transformative for him so he thought a lot about death and he eventually goes to bhutan and i'm not sure why he chose bhutan i don't he doesn't get in Maybe he does, but Where I don't that? remember. Um, I think Bhutan is in like Southeast Asia, okay. somewhere around there. And so they are, even though they are ranked 130, 134th on the list of most developed nations, I think out of 150, um, they're among the world's 20th happiest, 20 yeah. happiest countries. Yeah, it's not about money or possessions. No, and so it's about connection. they have, they yeah. even have like a minister of happiness in Bhutan. Right. Isn't that in the movie Happy? I don't remember, but Mm. yeah, they have a minister of happiness. And so, but they also have, they have no debt. Most people don't have any debt there, which obviously is really important for happiness. But they also, death is a huge part of their culture. And he was even saying, so he was recently on Peter Atia's podcast. I just listened to it. I'm sorry, this guy? This guy, yeah, yeah. So he was saying when he went to Bhutan, like they have these like little almost like they almost remind me like maybe like like little anook shooks that you see all the time when you're driving on the highway in northern ontario mm-hmm. but all over the place they have these like little kind of clay statues that have mixed in at like ashes of someone who's cremated so that idea of death is with them all the time like mm-hmm. their funerals last like 21 days or something like that they're always being re- they're supposed to think about death three times a day Think about it in the sense of you're it's gonna go- die. It's gonna happen. So therefore, live every life, live every moment to its fullest. Is that the? I think so. Well, he one of the philosophers it says, if I take death into my life, acknowledge it, and face it squarely, I will free myself from the anxiety of death and the pettiness of life, and only then will I be free to become myself. Mm-hmm. It is true, though, to to think about impending doom. Like if you knew if you yeah. knew when you were gonna die or whatever, like. Would you be doing what you're doing right now? Is, is this exactly. is this what's going to make you happy? Is this going to be the thing that yeah. that you want to spend your last your last moments with? We've talked about this so many times about the the lure of near death experiences that people yes. have and how it makes their life so sweet, like the moments after, like moments uh, a week or two or whatever, and then they talk about how it fades 
And then, okay, well, now I'm back to paying my bills. Now I'm back to going to the daily grind and taking the subway, going to work and whatever. Like it fades. And they want to have it back yeah. so bad to get that like jolt of life. Um, so, yeah, it's the same kind. Of, and I think that's the same kind of thing in terms of trying to maybe not have a near-death experience, but make your if you're constantly thinking about it, then yeah. it's always in your mind to be like, you know what? Yeah, I am going to die. I need to make this moment count because yeah. death could come knocking on my door tomorrow. So I'm going to make today the best day that I can. Well, and it also reminds me of... Don't sweat the small stuff. It reminds me of like with Jewel. Again, I'll go back to that oh, right. moment, right? Yeah. And that idea of impermanence and nothing's permanent. Even if you're going through difficult times, it's not going to last forever. Yeah. And so it's the same thing with life. It's not going to last forever. Or the grand scheme of things. What's important? What's important. And he talks to a Buddhist thinker and this Buddhist thinker says, when you start to understand that death is coming, you see things differently. You change your mental course and you naturally become more compassionate and mindful. Mm. And I think that's hundred percent true. Cause we're all, we're all mortal. Like, and it makes you, I think a kinder person to think, to think about that. Mm. So, and yeah, and it definitely changes your course in your life. And how do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered as the dickhead that yelled at the cashier in the checkout line because you can't yeah are you talking about that target guy with the toothbrush guy what the no, what's that guy's I name know. i don't know oh sure. i don't know he 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 saw sorry, sorry he saw like a tooth an oral b toothbrush like an electric one so like mm-hmm. a good one it had the uh, he took a picture of it and it had a thing it said display on it but zero one cent oh. and he took it to the target the cashier he's like I want this for free. Oh, this is the law or whatever. And he was like berating her yeah. on yeah. S- Instagram. And of course he got roasted and then people pulled together and, and donated like a GoFundMe for $30,000 to this, to this lady. And he took like an unflattering picture of her. her half oh, of her eye was closed awful. in the middle of explaining. Cause she's like, no, I'm not going to give this to you. And he could for like a penny. Cause yeah. this is like a hundred dollar yeah. toothbrush. And yeah. it's like, it says display. And he's like, this is the law. And he's like, I'm going to put it. And it's like, and people are like, ah, it's actually not the law. It's only if it's like, up to a certain amount and all oh, okay. obviously if it's yeah. not like yeah. clearly uh, an error anyways so but yeah don't don't be that guy <laughs> yeah because yeah, yeah. he was in the news again tweeting berating somebody on twitter oh because someone said something there i'm teaching my kids like history right they're all about columbus and he didn't agree with it and he's like i'm gonna call child protective services and he's like he's literally showing tweets of his phone and how long he's on the line for to oh, child protective this guy services needs to go get and, laid or and something and people were like it was like over like an hour or like an hour oh. and people were like yeah good job You're a piece actually of shit. taking up the time for yeah. people that actually, actually need, need to it. get kids out of situations yeah. where they're getting beaten or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. and here you are because you don't it's agree a, with how someone's teaching their kids yeah. you're going to call that yeah. because they're teaching them about Christopher Columbus or yeah. whatever mm-hmm. like it but this is the thing it goes back that, to that, that, finding problems yeah, when there is no problem like, this is this is my like, this is like this is my cause i gotta yeah. put up this mantle of yeah no it's this is what my life is right and of course yeah, yeah. anyways yeah it's, it's so he he talks to i'm not sure who it is he talks to when he's in bhutan but the guy says it's like the difference between their life in bhutan and their um, outlook and like the Western outlook. And he says, you act like life is fulfilling a checklist. Um, I get a husband, a car, a good house, a promotion. I get a better car, a better house. And I make a name for myself. And it's like, but this plan will never materialize perfectly. And even if it does, then what? You don't settle. You add more items. No, there's to the always checklist. a better car. There's yeah. always a better house. There's always yeah. a better husband. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's none. Oh, you're too kind. Um, but no, that's the, the minimalist that's, guys talk yeah. about that all the time. It's yeah. like, I was just consumed by the, it always has to be better. always has to be more. There's always the next promotion. It's like, and people have this mindset. If I only had this, then I will be happy. It's like, you're never going to be happy with that thing because you're not chasing the right things. Yeah. hundred percent. But that's what we're conditioned. It's like keeping up with the Joneses. Oh, I got to feel like I need to have this to, to, to feel like I'm fitting in. Right. Or uh, well, I need to have that car because that car shows a certain status or whatever. And it's like, doesn't make all that happy. stuff is bullshit. It doesn't, and doesn't mean anything. And, and so is that, I mean, going back to death then too, like you can't take it with you and no one's going to say, oh yeah, that guy had so many nice cars. No, people are going to remember like, were you a nice person? <laughs> that guy was an asshole to me. Yeah. Like that's, people aren't going to come to your room because you had like a Porsche or something. Like people are going to come to your room because you were just a good person and they're yep. going to miss you. Exactly. And yeah. that you brought value to their lives. Exactly. Not a Ferrari. Yep. So. 
unless you bring value to my life by giving me a Ferrari, <laughs> then I will come to your funeral. <laughs> but even then, you're not going to know, so I probably won't. So if anybody out there wants to get me a Ferrari, I am accepting them. <laughs> Just FYI. <laughs> I will come to your funeral. I'll RSVP. Yeah, I will RSVP to, to your, your funeral. funeral. Well, no matter where in the world, as long as I can drive really fast to it. <laughs> so the next thing he talks about is exercise. And he talks about in the mid-1990s, um, anyone who is a runner is going to know this guy's name. Richard Simmons. No. Sweat to the oldies. No. Timothy Noakes, he wrote the book Born to Run about how the fact that we are born to run. Mm. It's actually one book I haven't read about running. I was going to say, you know, I'm like, oh, you've read this one, no, obviously. I haven't. No, I haven't, actually. Huh. I, it's, on my, it's on my very long list of books. You right. don't want to see my very long list. So... The thing is, is like, not only are we born to run, if you look at traditional hunter-gatherer tribes. Born to climb too. We're born to carry because, and this is something he talks about when he's on his hunt, you have to run or walk to find the animals. Not only that, in a lot of these, um, back in the day, we we can outrun and outmove animals. That's just how we are built. We're not built like any other animal in that sense. We're really good at... Um, what is the word, temperature control in our bodies. And so we can go for really long distances and maintain our body temperature, whereas something like an antelope cannot, and they tire out quickly and they can't manage their body temperature like we can. So basically, you'll run them down. That's how we can yeah. touch them is by running them, like outrunning them, like endurance-wise, not yeah. speed But ever, I, But I mean, but. well, yeah, because I mean, those animals can run real fast right except for like i think there's one guy that can run faster this might be usain bolt but that, that's about <laughs> it he's leaving everybody to this but now you can only do that for like yeah. a couple hundred meters there's there is but, a there is a tribe out there that does and i've actually i've listened to another podcast about it about this guy who like embedded with this tribe and that's what they did yeah. they just ran like uh, like ultra marathons all day no, no, trying to uh, run down this no I was, I was i was gonna say because yeah humans can run for like hours and hours or you know even days almost or whatever um yeah especially for condition to it so yeah. it makes sense if other animals yeah can't run that long but they can run fast right yeah. so then yeah but they get tired you see that too with other predators and prey where yeah, they'll just run them down they'll run and it's like oh tire well, them out and then the one just like stops it's like and you're gonna die keep yeah. going yeah but yeah but they literally can't then the other yeah. thing that we're born to do is to carry because then what do you have to do once you run down your kill you gotta carry it back to camp you're run all the way back to so camp. we're again we're one of the only animal we are one of the we are the only animal that like carries carries our shit and like carries our whatever we like kill we carry it back to where it goes so well, other animals will bring it back to their den or whatever if they kill if they make a kill or whatever right maybe they bring, bring it back, back to the babies or whatever they don't they don't carry it well i guess to, to how you define it with your hands even well, other primates don't carry like we carry we're okay. built for it all right so what kind of carry then is it is it more of a is it over the shoulder carry on the head or you know like whatever, a boulder whatever type of carry that's because I, I think there's a lot of people that do functional old school type of workouts where they'll go into just go into the forest and like pick up logs and whatever like you know are you Flip carrying the tires yeah, yeah are you carrying the it. logs on your shoulder or it. are you like a big boulder and you're walking well, whatever around whatever you to... can do that's what we're built yeah. for one interesting thing is he says the brain uses the unpleasant but illusory sensations of fatigue to pump the brain the body's brakes well before a person become becomes close to real physical exhaustion. Well, that's that 40% I, that Goggins that's what talks I have, about, right? That's exactly what I have written, Goggins, 40% rule. And that's right. what it is, right? Our brain get our... Uh, so then why is that? If we're... Why is that? To protect to protect our, our physiology, to protect ourselves, right? So that we don't injure ourselves inadvertently by going over. I think that's probably what it would be. Even though we can go over? Because like, again, would like be if you're hunting guess. for your food and you're like 10 minutes in, you're like, ugh. I can't, you know, I'm too tired. You're not going to be able to go for days because you're going to, you're going to hit that wall, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. So. I don't know. Yeah. So he talks a lot to, um, he ends up getting, meeting up with this guy who has this company called Go Ruck. And so this is the new thing. And right. this is what I was telling you about why here, I'm kind here, of into this. Here here this is where this comes from. Go. Yes. <laughs> is so now people are getting into rucking and this army's force. They've been that for forever. Been, beginning of time have rucked because it's important. And even if you look at the stats of um, 
injuries in like the armed forces whatever it is there's more injuries when soldiers run versus when they ruck and even by rucking it's so good for you because you're forcing so maybe define it a little bit what rucking is so rucking is you're just you're carrying a load like wherever it is you're carrying a load and you're going for like like on a a backpack basically yeah on a backpack and you have like like a a hip strap you strap in you just put a weight in and you 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 walk as fast as you can yeah or you just walk whatever it is sometimes but yeah yeah but no it's more rucking is more of it's a it's a fast walk yeah so and but like it builds your your cardiovascular system it builds that up and obviously it's you're having to all your whole your whole core is working if you're going Mm. uphill or downhill you're working your core quads like it works everything and so it's so important um it's just so important to do and so that's the new thing now that's my new thing is rucking so um yeah but that's different than how hunter gatherers used to carry because they never had backpacks they didn't have backpacks but i mean it's still um it's still carrying a load just <laughs> regardless of what yeah, you're, you're not physically it. carrying it with your arms yeah. or whatever but yeah but i mean i guess if you're putting something on your shoulders it's kind of the same that's just that's very uncomfortable yeah. when you're like carrying a log on your shoulder but the the one the one study he quotes in here um I, it's it, this study freaking blew me away it blew the researchers away and they did not think this was right and they had to go back and look at and reinvestigate the data, the data. yeah because yeah. it's so crazy so they compared um a group they had a group of people that were pre-diabetic and so they gave some people metformin which is like first line of defense if you're pre-diabetic it's the first thing they're going to prescribe just you. Some, some drug it's just a pill it's just a pill sure and or they were prescribed just 50 minutes a day 50 minutes a day go for a walk that's it a walk, even just like walk. a light walk. Light walk, 50 minutes a day, just go. Oh, I, I know exactly. After what this is three, long. just 15 minutes, like that's it. And they're just like, oh, that's not going to do anything. This is ridiculous. After three years, the first group reduced their incidence of diabetes by 31%. That's pretty good. Like metformin is a very powerful drug. It's a, people actually use it in longevity as well, not just for diabetes. The other group, the walking group, for 15 minutes a day, that's it. They decrease their incidence of like diabetes. 100% almost? 58%. Okay. That's freaking huge. For only 15 minutes. So can you it's imagine? It's almost double what the drug you imagine? is. Yeah. And could you imagine what it was if you even walked for longer? Like that's unreal to me. It's, no. it's just like blue, 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 no, blue but my we, mind. Is it? To me, to me, with everything that we know, it's I like know. that's actually, it's almost logical because movement is like the core to keeping us yeah healthy and active and keep you know, and keep our blood flowing and keep everything, everything moving right everything keep and everything he, moving i feel like a broken record here, and he but. talked he talked to uh stuart mcgill the back guy and he yeah. was like yeah like rucking is really really good for you because it strengthens everything strengthens yeah. those back muscles obviously and he even the one biomechanist that he talked to says like we're suffering today from like diseases of captivity so we are like the orca in the tank with the the fin curved over yeah. and it's like oh my god that's so freaking sad what have we done to ourselves yeah and it's funny too because you hear about those whales in captivity and then they just snap and kill somebody or yeah. whatever but i mean f- number one they're killer whale- whales <laughs> that's, that's, what what they, that's what they do <laughs> that's what they do so that's one thing but it's also like is that why you know because you, you we always talk about why are there so many shootings school shootings particular in the united states yeah what's going on here right and like whatever if you think it's the cause is because of, no like listen guns are not walking into school shooting people people, people are doing are that yeah. why are they doing that right yeah. obviously i think if they didn't have guns they do something else like what is going on is it yeah. that kind of thing where we're living in such again everything is so easy so comfortable yeah. there's no sense of purpose there's no nothing we're living in captivity yeah and people are just snapping yep like, yeah. could that is that well, one of the reasons why th- there's well such a be. huge increase in, in, in that, that type of violence. Um, yeah. Because it wasn't happening like that before 100 years ago, I don't think. I don't know. I don't know what the, the rates are. Yeah. But it seems know. like there's another. I mean, th- doesn't one happen almost like every day in the States? I don't know. It's Some type of shooting nuts. anyways. Maybe it's not necessarily a specific school, school shooting, shooting, but it's like it happens thing. all the Some time. type of violence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The last thing that I'll talk about, and it's just a quickie, is and has to do a lot too with the pandemic and my issues around hand sanitizer. But we are living in an age mm. where we are over sanitized right. and our hygiene is out of control. Nothing can be dirty. We're using sanitizer all the time. 
Especially oh, now, the amount of sanitizer I see, I'm disgusted by. Bob, I never use that stuff. Just Me, like I never even take penicillin if I don't have to. Well, antibiotics or whatever. Well, you're gonna take it if you're in a life. No, if situation. I need to, but I mean. But my point anyways. is, is our microbiome, even on our skin, our skin microbiome is so important. It affects our mood, our immunity, our metabolism, everything. It's so important, and so using all this hand sanitizer for the last almost three years it's and then all the ones they pulled off because they have like toxic crap carcinogens or whatever it's unreal to me so i just had to add that quickie in well as part of, i mean that yeah I don't, I don't know like it's like i think i remember some doctors talking about oh if you have your vegetables just don't wash your vegetables and just eat them out the ground because there's all those microbes yeah. and you can get yeah, those yeah. beneficial bacteria yeah, and whatever course, yeah. yeah there's lots of stuff we've learned about the microbiome and the gut yeah. and having harmony and like challenging like because when you have antibiotics or um hand sanitizer or whatever it's like you're killing you the whole idea is you're killing everything right which is fine because you're going to kill the bad stuff but you're also going to kill the good stuff and then what's left over is this like open season for something to come in and just right and colonize and if you get a bad bacteria or bad whatever that just takes over everything yeah yeah that's it leads to infection and of course by having everything sterile as well too and your body's not used to seeing you know, foreign invaders or whatever, then your immune system is, you know, it's, it's, it's not as strong because it's not of being course, used, not, yeah, of course. you know, like I guess if you don't, you don't use, use it, you lose it. it. So in your body, like if I, I, I don't know how that works. So I'm not going to say too yeah, much yeah. about that. But yeah, from yeah. what I know is that when you're constantly being exposed to different things, it just helps your immune system kind of be able to pick up on good things, bad things or whatever. Yeah. And it's just kind of, it's like, it's basically like equilibrium. Think of your body and everything as like this giant forest where everything is all together. Yeah. But when you burn the forest down, like one thing at least is just going to start and grow. I, that's a bad example because forest fires are actually really good for yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But the idea anyway. is that one thing can just kind of colonize and yeah. just kind of take over. So it's just not good for you. The Anyways. Point, the point is with all of this, I think you can sum it up by saying there's this concept, I think we've talked about it before, called hermesis. And that is... It's just like when you're lifting weights, right? You're putting stress on the muscle, but that muscle's going to grow and it's going to grow bigger and stronger. And that's true After with the stress, yeah. everything in our body. We need to stress our body a little bit in order to be better in all areas. And so I think that that's yeah. what we need to move towards. What doesn't kill you only makes, makes you stronger. And it's 100% true. why that's the saying. Yep. It's 100% true for everything. Yeah. So... Yeah, so that's the book. Unless it doesn't kill you, but it cripples you. <laughs> that's yeah. not good either. So, so, yeah. so that's the book. Yeah, I mean, does he talk a lot about? I guess he goes a lot about into society or whatever. Does he? Does he come up with any kind of solutions as to? Um, you I know? think well, because I think like he he does like he talks to a lot of these different researchers that are doing research on. I mean, there was one that was able to prescribe like how many how much time you should spend in like different nature settings, right? Like because if you live in the city, right, it's going to be a bit harder to. So there's even like once a year if you can go out into like actual backcountry wilderness, like right. for like a week, like you know, like that's good. Yeah. So he was talking to those um, different people. So a lot of individual solutions, not so yeah. much like here's what society as a whole should do no, because you I can't think, you gotta change from within i yeah, think to be able course. to yeah and i think the Masogi and him going out and doing this this big hunt and talking to like he talks about Masogi quite a bit throughout right so, so the so this Masogi thing i always think of the the misogyny so this misogyny thing that you want to do <laughs> yeah. we'll talk about books in terms of what you want to incorporate mm-hmm. what would you want to do we talk about doing the crazy mm-hmm. adventurous stuff but yeah. not anything into the point of actually failing and then you're gonna die yeah, kind of thing of like course. that's like oh, i'm gonna of just course. go walk up like a tightrope across like a canyon it's yeah. like eh, no <laughs> right but what is something that's appealing to you and if so what kind of thing would be appealing to you something that is so maybe if you don't if you fail you're not gonna die but it's like so one well, i'm gonna try to climb a mountain or one family know. that there was a homeschool family when we lived in Sudbury and they did this with their, um, they have four kids and they would do this with their kids and then their other family, like sister or brother or whatever, they mm-hmm. would do the same thing with them as well. And they would go once a year, they would go to a provincial park and they would be there for, uh, two weeks backcountry camp camping and Clarny Algonquin Algonquin. 
And so they would go and it's two, it's two weeks and it's back country. So you're eating dehydrated food. You're doing hard things. They would make, she like would say like, you know, like we make them go out in the rain and paddle. If we got to paddle that day and it rains, well, that's just what we have to do. Yeah. You know, we, we try to push that discomfort a little bit and I think yeah. that's important. Yeah. So something like that would be cool. Which we've done before. So Which we've done before. So we might not be as discomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> discomfortable. Well, well it's, it's about the experience. We know oh, what to sure. expect and stuff. For sure. So that would be kind of cool. Uh, trail running. I think Tristan would really, really love to do trail running yeah. and that can be hard. Well, we've already started. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what about you? What do you yeah, I mean, I, I think there's obviously challenges in terms of, um, you know, into the real world of we have to bills to pay and whatever in terms of challenging in terms of starting a business and everything like that. So that's Absolutely. one challenge. Um, Absolutely. But definitely physical challenges really oh, yeah. uh, pique my interest. Um, doing something like that backcountry would be fantastic. Uh, like two weeks, just go whatever. Mm. And I, I'd almost like to see what it'd be like to do it alone. To, Ugh, to just go no myself way. and I've seen other people do it. it's like oh it's yeah. like finally you know one week backpacking mm. across whatever yeah um so that would be as it'd be a different challenge right because yeah. you're by yourself so that's almost like a personal thing yep um but now on the spot um yeah I don't think this is so much of a challenge but like skydiving Ugh. would always be something where it's <laughs> no just thanks. it's not so much of a <laughs> life or death thing but it's like pushing yourself through your comfort level of what you know that's you're sc- supposed scary shit, to be right? afraid of that that you're supposed to be afraid. no of i fights. know but <laughs> what's at the what's at that at the most afraid right mm. after that is the moment of bliss because everyone course. says the freedom of falling of and the, and even the beauty of it as well too if you're of seeing course. whatever yeah of course surrounding of so course. that would be something but again that's i think that's a little cheesy <laughs> um to be honest because that's not like anybody can do it that's just yeah. like a matter of money <laughs> you know of like well, oh, just yeah. pay my money and, yeah, and go yeah. skydiving yeah but yeah i i, I think of something like biking across canada mm-hmm. you know like cool. that's kind of where it's a real again mm-hmm. where are you gonna where are you gonna poop <laughs> yeah you know that's a it's a big challenge so that's the kind of thing that yeah. i think of not so much like even walking across canada would be like amazing be really cool. but i also don't have three months to just go and do that but yeah. that being said you never know what can mm-hmm. happen yeah but that would be an adventure be cool. yeah but yeah something stuff like that that's really yeah. really hard endurance yep um pushes to, you yeah pushes you but the beauty and mm-hmm. like every night going to bed under the stars or whatever yeah. after like a good you know 300 kilometer bike or whatever yeah. you can do in a day Absolutely. maybe not that's a lot but mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying yep for sure yeah for sure i think so cool one to ten, the comfort crisis. So I'd give the book an eight out of ten. Okay. However, if you are going to read, no, 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 no. What's your you, rating? It's eight out of ten. If you're going to read one personal development book this year, this is the book to read. Over habits, atomic habits. Uh, yeah. Really? Yeah, really. Um, it hits everything it mm. hits every single thing it's a holistic thing that's looking at everything not just building hat like that's a, the habits is a different book this one is talking about i more, know but it's about helping you know figure yeah. out what's not good in your life and how you can yeah. make it better <laughs> by instilling habits yeah but i think this one is more because it just talks right. about so many different facets of life and what you can do to improve your life and just improve your resilience as yeah a person, and i was just so. gonna say it seems like it gives you some actual actionable advice yeah. or even at least things you can start to think about and how you can incorporate well, that in your life right and i think for me like i'm really i'm not a big i'm not on my phone all the time anyways but even thinking about how i can be less on my phone i think about that that's actually uh, sorry go ahead and go then ahead. and then rocking like we we're starting to do rock like rocking now right yeah, we, walk just, all you know, we walk all the time anyways, anyways. So we just throw a backpack on and go it's no big so deal it's no big deal right um so that being said, mm-hmm. here's another thing to do of going cell phone list for like a month. You know, give it up. That's a, an experiment, right? To see what it's like. A lot of people do this. Like, sure, what, but what does that mean? I'm not allowed to talk to my family? Okay, like, well, maybe if you're going to call to use a phone, okay. but like no cell phone, like just no phone. So no Nothing on the phone. Oh, yeah, I'd be that's fine. All. I'd be fine. Right? That, I'm just saying, right? Like, yeah. that's it's just an experiment to see, like, yeah. do you find... Because, like, what do you do sometimes? Like, I know I do, too. I'm not saying I'm perfect. Yeah. But, like, oh, I got, like, five minutes on the toilet. Beep, 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 SimCity or For whatever, sure. right? So, like, you can't do that anymore. So then what? Well, then maybe I'll bring a book. 
or something well, that's like what that. I did. Right? That's what I did back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> so well, as long as back I have, in the day when I was young, as I long, take a shit. literally <laughs> as long as I have a book. When I go out with the kids, I always have a book with me, and I will read my book before I pick up my phone. Oh right, well, like because you don't have data, but yeah, <laughs> that's not, I have a ton of games I could play on here that don't require data. No, no, I know. But I, know. I, I, I will know. always pick a book yeah. instead because I hate. I don't know. I just I don't, no. Yeah. I hate being on the phone yeah. in public. I think it's I, I so can't. rude. I don't know I what it is. I'm just like, I don't want to be rude. I yeah, but it's not rude because everyone know. does it and everyone's walking down. I know, down. but so I'm just like, like I, I'm like, I don't know. For me, it's like, I, I don't think it's socially acceptable and I don't want it. Of course it, it is. Everyone does I know, it. but I don't feel like it. Anyways, yeah. I have a problem with it. Do you it. remember when, this is going by, this is actually a class we had in first year. This was, I think it was, what class was it? Was it organic or was it inorganic chemistry? Or not spectroscopy i think is what it was I fucking hated that course. anyways it was a first year course oh god and this was back in 1999 right so like cell phones 2000 were, 1999 2000 well it was 99 because it was the first semester so uh this what we went september 1999 okay. is when we went to school okay. so is when cell phones were just starting to be a thing right and then it happened we were in chemistry class and then somebody's phone rang and it was like whoa someone's phone's ringing and everyone's quiet and he's like hello and everyone's kind of laughing he's like mm. oh i'm in class now and it was like I don't funny well, okay because it was like the first, first time, time it had happened. ever happened oh, for funny. like everyone because like and then after that it was like shut your goddamn phone up it's so rude I don't but it's like everyone that. in the class and of course there was like 200 people in the class oh, yeah, it was, it was big, one of those first big, year big yeah you don't classes. remember that well, I, maybe you weren't in that class. Maybe I was, it was a class. in. I was in spec. No, but I don't think it was that. I think it was another Trust class me, that you okay. weren't. You weren't in. Yeah, probably. Because um, if it's spec, I all I remember was because we didn't have very many classes together at all. We had spec together, but I remember it was in the spring, the spring semester. Yeah. I didn't have. I didn't have spec f- in September. Okay, so I just. Sure. I just remember that That's moment funny. so bad because. And I was like, I was pissed off because I'm like, oh, that's what so rude. Because I was so anti-technology, which I still am. <laughs> I know. Are, but everyone's yeah. like, that. everything was funny. Or whatever. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I didn't go funny 20 years when someone's <laughs> phone goes off in All class. It's like. Anyways, that was funny. That's funny. Um, yeah, I don't know what that story is. Uh, I don't know what that, why that came up. Being but off your phone. Yeah. Are we done? Yes. Did I um, you get the mine? rating? Yeah, got the rating. Yeah, we got to put up the good read. Rating as well. Yeah. I yeah, keep remember sure. to do that. For sure. Um, cool. Yeah. I think that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Thank we appreciate you. it yeah. as always. Check us out, odumanander.com. All of our podcasts are on there. With that being said, Ooh. high five. High five. Let's see if there's any more emergencies going on back there. Let's hope not. We should be okay. Mm-hmm. No one else has come running in. So yeah, we're good so to we're go. Good. Yeah. Thank you once awesome. again. Have yourself an uncomfortable week. Absolutely. Go rock. Go rock. Go (laughs) climb some mountains. Do whatever it is you got to do. Get uncomfortable. And uh, do your thing. Let us know how it goes. Yes. And we'll see you here next week. Have a good week.